minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Let's rock. You're now tuned into the Great Minds podcast. 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 Never give on, no boy like Cam on a song. Culture safe now, thank God. The panic is gone. Time to heal from the pain. Take the bandages off. Ain't gotta win. The stakes are high like a cannabis bomb. Okay, it's game time. Fix it with the balls. That's a face time. Great Minds spreading faster than a rumor through the grapevine. Born and Derek, what? Deserve the merit. Also. All right, welcome to the Great Minds Podcast. This is Derek. This is Vaughn. And we're here I'm with Ab- <laughs> we're here with Abel I Mary. St- I what's stepped good? on your shot, my bad. No, what's good, man? <laughs> I, got that Steph, I got that Steph Curry trigger, man. As soon as I catch it, I'm shooting, man. <laughs> it's all good, but um, green light, green light. Yeah. Word. Well, salute to pulling up, Abel Mary, man. We appreciate you, man. Man, I Definitely. appreciate everything y'all doing for the culture, man. Y'all putting out real dope content into the universe, man. We need that right now. Or Definitely. Know that. So uh, just a brief introduction, Abel Murray is a um, hip-hop artist um, from Ethiopia, uh, yeah. initially via LA, via yeah. um, Alexandria, Alexandria, Virginia. So um, yep. uh, we're here to talk about his project, Truth to Power, amongst other things. So we're going to kick it and have a good time, man. So salute. Right I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it, bro. Yeah. All right, so let's get into, like, what's a little bit of your background, man? Oh, man. So I was born in Ethiopia, um, but I left when I was three years old. Um, and we traveled all over the world. Like, my dad was, he was pursuing higher education. So we moved to the U.K. initially, like, right out of Ethiopia. So that was culture shock, like, going from, like, you know, being the majority to being somewhere where, like, you feel like a total outcast, didn't even speak the language. And we went, we moved to Brixton, which is, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if you know, that's like Harlem. That's the UK <laughs> version of Harlem, right? Oh yeah, I heard, so, I heard about it. <laughs> Brixton, yeah, man. And this is, we talking about the 80s, right? So this is, it's real rough out there. So it's like, you know, going straight into like freezing water, you know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. it was culture shock, just kind of like um, acclimating to the environment, kind of feeling like an outcast. And then um, after a year, we moved to like like Wales, which was the total opposite. This is like out in the sticks. And I was the only black kid. Mm. Um, So I was in a school full of people that were like touching my hair. Like I felt like like a science project almost, you know what I'm saying? Because they never seen it. And like they just innocent kids. But at the same time, it's like kids are like really mean, you know what I'm saying? Whether they, you know, there's malice behind it or not, it just feels weird. So it was just like a bunch of culture shock. And then from there, we went to Bahrain, which is like by Saudi Arabia. They were actually in the news today because they did a peace treaty with the United States and uh, with Israel. Okay. So um, it's like going to like a Muslim country. Like this is, you know, complete 180 degrees the other way. Um, and then after that, uh, we stayed there for five years. We went, we moved to LA. Um, so LA 1990 to 92. So um, Gulf War popped off, <laughs> bounced to LA, and then the rice. <laughs> Worry up. <laughs> I'm like, yo, there's a cloud following me around, man. Can't catch a break. <laughs> um, yeah, right? I was like, is it me? Like, you know, I'm bringing negative energy everywhere I go. Um, but, you know, like, it's, it, it, it hardens you, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you keep getting put in these environments and there's, like, nobody around, it's like sink or swim. So subconsciously, you know, at the time, it doesn't feel like it. You feel like, you know, it's just like a curse. But long term, it's a blessing because you learn how to fit in all these different places, different cultures, different economies, different governments. Definitely. So like, you know, as an artist, seeing all these things as a, as a young person, it, it shapes like the, the content that you're able to create because you've seen so many different things and you can pull from all these different experiences. Right. Um, and then moved to Virginia in 92 and then just been here ever since. So yeah, DMV area is where I rep now. So, no doubt. So, so you you well versed with different different places. So passport, I was gonna, passport stamped up, man. I'm about to say stamped <laughs> up for real. I, I was going to ask you how how does that um how does that affect your music? Well, for, before music, first of all, how did it affect you growing up and seeing these different cultures, different different places, different you know, like you stated, going to Wales, being like one of the only black kids, then going there, going to Saudi Arabia, right outside of there, then going to L.A. How does that really affect you as a kid moving around like that? Well, it teaches you that, like, the world is a lot bigger than your media market or your zip code, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
people don't get an opportunity to travel like in their lifetime. You know what I'm saying? So like I got a lifetime worth of traveling in 10 years. You know, so it opens your eyes to all these different cultures. You're not the only person. The world is bigger than you. You know, there's people on the other side of the earth that have no conception of the things you've seen and experienced. And you bring that to them and they bring that to you. So like you see that the universe is bigger than you and how small you are relative to like, you know, the, the world. Um, as far as being an artist, like you're able to see different perspectives and see different people's angles. You know, if you live in one neighborhood your whole life, everything you see, it's the same mailman that you've seen your whole life. It's the same, you know, corner store you go to, the same 7-Eleven, the same library, same school, same movie theater, right? So how much can you actually offer in terms of world experience, you know, other than kind of like the things you go through personally on a personal note? Um, and even that is real small. It's a small microcosm of what the universe is. So I think that it gave me like a unique perspective to be able to, to share like, you know, stories from, you know, experiences from these different places to, you know, people all over the world. So when you're going through it, it's tough. You don't really see, like you see the, you know, oh man, I got to move new friends. I got to, you know, yeah. figure out, you know, who's the bully in this neighborhood. I got to <laughs> myself. I got to stand up to these. It's like deja vu all over again, but long term, it, it, it's like, it's priceless. I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah. I was, yeah. Asked, I was actually going to ask that, like, um, how do you, how did you feel in the moment where it's like, Yo, we here and we got to go to Saudi Arabia. I mean, not that yeah. you had the concept of Saudi Arabia, but, you know, putting yourself in that in that time frame, what was that like? You, you get used to it, man. You'd be surprised. Like, the human mind can adapt. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, it's, it's crazy when we can actually, when we're, when we're forced to, when we don't have a choice, like, the, the limits that we're able to push. So, um, after a while, I, it, it was like, I think the, the biggest culture shock was going from Ethiopia to the U.K., because I didn't speak the language. I couldn't even communicate, right? right. So I mm-hmm. couldn't even express myself. If I had an issue, I just had to, like, hold it in. I couldn't tell the teacher. I couldn't tell anybody. And mm-hmm. if I got lost, you know, in the subway station, I couldn't even tell them anything. I'd just be walking around until they came and found me. So, <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest part. And then once you conquer that, then you're like, yo, it's really nothing. You know what I'm saying? If I have to make it through that, it, you know, I, I can make it through pretty much any any kind of, like, adjustment I need to make. Where definitely I, I can figure just by you moving around, just by your vibe, if you have a real strong family family connection. So your family's really tight. So I'm pretty sure, right? Because going uh, yeah, to these absolutely. different places, everyone's very really tight. So you have any you have any siblings? At yeah, all? it's just me. Uh, My, I got one little sister. So and she okay. she we're like I what they call Irish twins, we're like four like a year and two months apart. Yeah. So yeah. She went through everything with me, right? So she's okay. like my ride or die. Like, so, you know, it's always like easier when you have somebody that you can, at least even when you come home, you know, you have somebody you can kind of share the experience with a little. And she's a gangster too, right? So <laughs> <laughs> she was my security the whole time. <laughs> so anybody Definitely. I got problems with, I just, you know what I'm saying? She right there, so. Yeah, the females right, always out. ride the hardest, man. Yo, they That's the real gangsters, do. man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um. Yeah. How did the time, like, I guess around the uh, L.A. riots, you had to be, what, 10 to 12 years old? Yeah, I was, that sound? yeah, like 10, 10, yep, yeah, 10, 11. Yeah. And it kind of, it kind of, uh, a lot of the stuff with Koreatown, that's where you, you were in that area, correct? Yeah, so we lived in Koreatown, um, but when it actually started, like, I was, like, maybe two or three miles away from, like, where they, you know that scene where they jumped the truck driver? Yeah, yeah. Florence 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 Normandy. Normandy. yeah, Florence and Yeah, Reginald Denny. So, Reginald Denny with the brick. I, yeah, it was, mm-hmm. man, that's, that's hor- horrific, and like, to, to watch that video again. But um, I was, like, at a friend's house, and we were, like, like literally, it's, like, a maybe a five-minute drive from there. So I, I saw the smoke before I knew what was going on because mm. they were mm-hmm. lighting stuff up, right? So we could see it. We were outside of the friend's house. L.A. neighborhoods, even the hood is, like, suburbs, right? You remember Friday? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying like how that neighborhood was. That's like the hood, but it looks like it's a middle class, regular, regular Word. neighborhood, grass and the, the lawn, like snowfall, like those. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So <laughs> we also have, <laughs> we also have playing, and I see smoke, but I'm thinking like you know, like it's a regular fire, and then we started seeing more smoke, like in the skyline. So I'm like, yo, there's no way there's like five things burning at the same time. <laughs> and then one of my friends' mom come outside, and she's like, yo, everybody get in the house, everybody get in the house. So we run in the house and like my friend's mom was at home. So we we just watching cartoons and then all of a sudden they just turned everything off and then you know Fox Five, all of them, they went to um like the news coverage of it and that's how we figured out what was going on. And it was just like they burned that whole city down, man. How'd that crazy. 
how did that, how did that, how did that affect you? Because I, I mean, it's different. We're on the East Coast, and we see it on the yeah. news, and like we can't really. I mean, we can relate to it, but it's not in our backyard, so it hits us a little differently. Yeah. Uh, how did that in particular affect you? Well, like in LA, like there was already tension. Like this was the breaking point. You know what I'm saying? This is where like the national media started covering it, but there was already like a bunch of stuff that led up to this. So there was this young lady that got killed by Korean store owners. Yeah, I remember oh, that. Yep. That was That's crazy. Right. Yeah. Young, Natasha young girl, something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that was, was crazy. Actually, it was a total mistake because she was actually trying to pay for it. But right. I, it, it was like that scene from um, Menace to Society. Like they got robbed so many times, they were shell shot. You know what I'm saying? So they yeah. any any kind of a feeling of being threatened, they just shoot. You know, they're gonna ask questions later. Right, absolutely. So the lady, the store owner, she um she she shot at her and she killed her, right? So she got off scot free. Like she didn't get like probation or nothing, right? Oh, they wow. they were able to say that she was acting in self defense somehow, some way. And like the so we were coming right off of that, you know, and then you see mm -hmm. Rodney King happening. And then all the, you know, it's live on tape. It's the same thing that happened with George Floyd. It's cops getting caught on camera. It starts everything, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, when, when uh, the Rodney King thing happened, everybody was like, okay, we got it this time. You know, four cops yeah. live on camera. There's no way they're getting off. There's no right? way getting off on that, yeah. Nah, I mean, they moved the court. They, they moved the case to this county where it was like 85% of the cops live. Because they argued that, like, the cops wouldn't be able to get a fair trial in L.A. In yeah, they're going to be biased. Because, mm -hmm. Yeah, which, um, which they were able to. So, all right, cool. Then maybe that's true. So then just move it to somewhere that's neutral. You can't move it. To, <laughs> yeah. You can't make it a home you can't game. move it over right? there. Yeah, yeah pretty you're much. not going to play. I, yeah, we're just going to let Golden State have all home games in the finals. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're trying to do, right? So, and then they came out and they said not guilty on on, And then that's – it was just too much, man. And you could feel the tension. Like, we were just sitting there. Like it was palpable. Like you just feel the tension. It was, and then when it happened, it was just like everybody just lost it. You know but, what's crazy? Um, uh, uh, like the same thing with like the O.J. Simpson, right? So like, I'm, I mean, nine out of ten people, ninety-nine out of hundred people feel like O.J. did it. I mean, yeah. whether he did it or not, he got off or whatever. But the fact that he got—that's why kind of like the fact that he got off. It was like a celebration. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think they thought it was like the makeup call. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, I missed the foul on one absolutely. end. Absolutely. Just call a foul. I take a random, a random end. reaching foul. Yeah, um, and it was like it was out of desperation. You know what I'm saying? Because you're like, yo, I'm thinking of like the plight of black people, man. This is crazy. Like the stuff that's going on. Landed the free home of the brave. We say that it ain't nothing like that out here, man. Not so at all. Like, this, that experience is it's a it's a fairy tale. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it was like um like the world sees America like we portray ourselves as like the beacon of democracy and in a lot of ways I mean it's the greatest country in the world but we're hypocrites too in a lot of ways you know what I'm saying oh yeah most we, we out here fighting for freedom for other people that we don't even have <laughs> yep. and so like I think that it was just I mean it was just so much man LA been through a lot Watts riots there was so much and then LAPD Daryl Gates was the um police commissioner at the time so he enacted a whole bunch of like outright racist stuff right so LA was sitting there like like what's going on like when are we going to get our turn so OJ was kind of like you know he benefited right because he didn't come to the hood his whole life yeah <laughs> went to college and never came back right so yeah. um he just was like the, he hit the lotto with that because a lot of black people that didn't like him and that thought that he was kind of a sellout based on how he acted um, they supported him because he represented like kind of like a vindication or like some sort of a, uh, you know, like we're getting our, our turn back. He just happens to be the guy that benefits from it. And he ain't rock with us like that. I mean, he, he said from the rip, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jay, Jay said it, right? 444. Four, four. That's it. But, yeah. But the thing is, you, you have that dream team, you got Johnny Cochran, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times it's that green, it's that money you can have to, to hire people. And, you know, you could even argue that it helped him because he went on the side of white folks, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he was, he went majority. So like him distancing himself from black people, it kind of gave him like a little wiggle room to be like, yo, I'm really this clean cut guy. Like, let's yeah. say it was somebody else. Let's say it was, um, you know, a different running back. Let's say it was Jim Brown. Or let's say it was <laughs> Jim Brown like, somebody modern, right? <laughs> he would like, have still Gurley. been in there. <laughs> say it was Todd Gurley. <laughs> Up, I don't done. care how many giant cockmans he got, man. He's not walking out of that courtroom, man. Not yeah. at all. Yeah, that's crazy. So, 
I was going to go back and, and, and trans, transition back into, into music. So I know that you started doing hip hop um, in, when you was in high school. So yeah, what yeah. grabbed you and pulled you? Were you with a group or did you hear somebody that influenced you to make you want to rap? How did that process go for you? Yeah, so um, like uh, I, I had like a love of words. I didn't realize this. Like somebody had to tell me that I had it. I had a fifth grade teacher that like I wrote this, she required us to write like a poem for like some, some uh, like class project in fifth grade. And she thought I plagiarized it. <laughs> so she pulls me to the side and um, she gave me an F on the joint. And then, you know, it was a, it was a Christian school too. Old black lady, oh. she, yeah, church lady, right? So she pulled me to the side and she's like, you know, Jesus can see this, right? And I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, I, I need you to, um, you know, rethink what you did you know like this is a you're a christian kid you shouldn't be you know copying poems and whatever i was like i don't know what you're talking about this is something i wrote myself and she was like all right if you wrote it yourself well i'm gonna give you another topic i want you to write one for me right now it's like all right cool so went to the side wrote it for her gave it to her and then she came back and she's like child you are blessed like you have <laughs> a gift you know what i'm saying like and she yeah. really put like the, the gas in me, like, I, I, okay, I can really do this. Cause I, I knew I liked doing it. I didn't know I was good at it. You know what right, I'm saying? Okay. That's a, this is, it's a difference. And somebody validated me early. So that's kind of like when I knew that I like words, as far as actual rapping, I had, I think it was 10th to 11th grade. I had a friend of mine that was um, from Brooklyn, New York. And um, he used to rap. So like, I had never thought of it or anything. I loved hip hop music, but just as a fan, I never saw myself as an artist. And he showed me some tapes one day at his house. He's like, yo, this is me rapping. And I was like, oh, where, how you do that? And he showed me, he had the karaoke machine set up and we were using, you know, the TDK tapes, everything is analog. Yeah. And um, he was like, do a verse. So I, I did like some little, maybe like an eight bar verse or whatever. And he sent it to some people in New York and they are like, yo, this is actually pretty good, right? And then that's kind of like what started it off. Okay. You know, I think it's a dope um, piece of that is basically you said a teacher help validate that for you. Because a lot of times you got rappers that say, teacher said I wasn't going to be anything, so I'm rapping yeah. about that. Nah, nah, he my nah, limo dropper. He my limo, limo dropper. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yo, my, yo my, my parents were paying tuition money, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she, she, she got to check that. You got to check for that. But I'm saying, but it's good to see that a teacher, you know, is telling kids that. Because you don't hear the stories about teacher telling kids that. We know that happens. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Kind of give them that, putting that battery in your back to kind of say, you know what, you all gifted in what you yeah. do. So it's good to hear. Definitely yeah. good to hear. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I I wish I had an address so I could send her some flowers, man. Word <laughs> up, man. You know what I'm saying? Or she out there somewhere. It ain't yeah. hard to find people now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the um Truth to Power um project, man. I um I listened to it a couple times, man. It, it, it's real dope. What I like about it, and, and we both like concept albums. And I think mm -hmm. what I really liked the, about the project is it it's a concept album, but like I think you touched on so many things. Now, I was going to ask what inspired you, but, I mean, you kind of covered that with just how you grew up and being from, um, you know, during the times with the L.A. riots and stuff like that yeah. um, happened. And I think it's, it's much needed. Um, what made you devote a whole project to that right now, though? Um, you know what? I didn't actually set out to create an album, to be honest with you. Like, um like my creative process is like, it's, it's really different. Like my workflow now, like um back in the day, you know, I used to just, you know, write rhymes over and over and over, right? And I have a bunch of verses and then I'll piece together the verses, like three verses that, that kind of go together. And then that will be what I'll record. Um, but like I, now I don't even write lyrics down. Like, so yeah. I just kind of just go into the zone. Like I hear a beat that I like, and then I would just, you know, kind of, just go and it'll turn it, you know, four bars, eight bars, four bars, and then you got a song. So what ended up happening was I, I made a couple songs. I made like over a weekend, I made like four songs or five songs. And then I was like, okay, this can be an EP. But like the creative burst just kept coming and I didn't want to slow it down. I was like, yo, I just got to do this. And this is quarantine. So I got some downtime. So then it turned into like eight songs. And I'm like, yo, eight is technically not an L, it's an LP, it's not an EP. And then one more weekend came and I had five more joints. And then I was like, I actually ended up doing like close to 30 songs. And then oh, I was wow. like, it's too much for like, you know, for the attention span. It's a, like you could do, you know, uh, yeah. Get Rich or Die Trying, or you could do like a Life After Death, All Eyes on Me, but it's just, it's too much information to give at one time. 
So I was just like, let me let me boil it down. I do 16 bars on a verse. So I was like, let me do 16 joints on the album. And I just whittled it down to 16 and then I, I submitted it. Right. No doubt. Yeah, I yeah. definitely like the way the album flows. And I know before you did this, you had an EP uh, um, on BLM. Yeah. EP, which, which, which was dope as well. But um, so because you're, I want, I want to say that you're a conscious rapper though. Like I think the word conscious get kind of thrown out there yeah. a little too much. I think you're a nice rapper that rap about topics that people care about. That's, that's important. I appreciate it. Topic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cause I don't, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. when, you, when you label people, remember back in the day it was like backpack rapper. It was it's lazy. Just that. It's, it's lazy. lazy. It's like, yeah. yo, that's not really what it is. And when I, when I like about your material is that it's, you, you don't curse in your material, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people, I think people cover up lyrics with curses. Oh, so yeah. like if you, if you can't feel something then you're going to say whatever you can say that sounds good, whatever it is, right? Sounds hard. Now, <laughs> yeah, so now I'm not opposed to that. Whatever floats your boat, you do. You and a lot, a that, lot right? of things rhyme with curse words, too. It's an easy yeah. fix. Oh, uh, you <laughs> can go. You know what I'm saying? Truck, I remember, like truck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember back Quick. in the day, you remember the song with, uh, with Heavy D, Don't Curse? Oh, they yeah. had that song where everybody was rapping on it. Yeah, they had yeah, some yeah. of the Greeks there rapping without curse, like Cool G rap. Yeah. From, I forgot who else was on that, but you know what I'm saying? But I like that flow. And even this album, it's, con it's well, quote unquote, conscious, but you, you flip your flows up on every, throughout, the, throughout the album. So yeah. I think that's really dope too. So I think it keeps the listener's ear. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because people don't, I hate to say, people don't like to be taught stuff. <laughs> right, you yeah. Stuff in the in the lyrics, you know. What I'm that's saying? that's so time. true, man. That's that's like, see, I could tell you listen, you really listen just based on your analysis right there. Like, it's really hard. Like when you say somebody's conscious, um, I remember Cameron in the interview was let's talking about like a girl. He told her like, oh yeah, Nas is my favorite rapper, and she was like, what Nas? I don't want to be doing all that thinking, you know what I'm saying? And she's saying yeah. this about Nas, you know what I'm saying? Like, so there is like a big part of it, like music is different to different people. Some people listen to music just to get away from reality and to just, you know, to zone out, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. So like, and sometimes even us, like people that, that are more like lyrically conscious people, we sometimes we just want to, you know, turn up, right? So there's a time and a place for that. But the hard part is to like drop jewels and then still be entertaining, you know what I'm saying? Like still right. like not be like, I don't want this to be a lecture. You know what I'm saying? I don't want right. this to, I'm not a professor up here. Like, I'm not a pastor, like at the pulpit. You know what I'm saying? I just want to keep it still interesting and um, have information and data that can edify the listener. And it's almost unconscious. Like they pick things up through the music and they're not even knowing that they're learning. You know what I'm saying? You're just like sneaking it in there. And that's yeah. like kind of a learned characteristic as an MC. Word. That's dope. Like a lot of people don't realize it. Like Rakim didn't curse. Yeah, yeah, never. If you, right, he's top ten, right? Top five. He, yeah. he, he, he certainly like if if that's somebody's goat, I'm cool with it. You know right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what I'm like, You can live with it. He's like, yeah, guys, absolutely. You can live with. It. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you so you got that. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the wire. Yeah. Omar never yeah. cursed, not yeah. once. Yeah. Only time one he my, cursed. One of my favorite shows, man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like I, I, I study the wire, so I know these random facts. Yeah. But like, the only time he cursed, which was once, he was quoting something somebody else said. Okay. So, <laughs> so I just say yeah. that to say, like, you know, when you don't even realize it, like that probably, like when I tell people that, that just sounds crazy. Like, oh my yeah, god, because his character is so dark, right? So it's like him and Marlo were like the two darkest dudes in the world. Word. They're polar opposites, though. Word. Yeah. Um, how'd you link with the source for uh, for the write up, man? Because I know the source is not like you know w what we grew up with. I mean, obviously it's still relevant, but like yeah. anything with the source, man, that was like the yeah. you know that's like the holy grail right there, man. It's like a bucket list type. Of yeah, thing. yeah. So I, you know, I I I actually said that I was like I want to make the source in the forest. Like, so I got one down, I got one to go. <laughs> or how that go. how that track. come about? Well, I, there's, they're like different curators of content that are actually writers, staff writers for different publications. So it's just a submission process. You submit your content to them. Mm -hmm. They get a bunch of stuff. And then if they like it, they'll reach back out. And then, you know what I'm saying? It goes from there. That's dope, man. That's definitely yeah. dope. But you, it's, it's, it's hard. Like when you send your stuff out as an artist, like, you know what I'm saying? You put your heart and soul into something. And then somebody come back and they'd be like, nah, I'm not vibing with it or whatever. Yeah, but like, I that's am. the risk you take every time, but, man. But know what? That that's the true artist. Though. That's part of being an artist. So like I never, like I always say, and as I got older, it comes with maturity. You know what I'm saying? When I was younger, 
you know, obviously I ain't listening to that. That's corny, whatever it is. Yeah. As I got older, I'm like, you know what? It's just that's just not for me. Right, right. It's not corny. It's just not yeah. for me. So it has a lane. Like I tell people all the time, I'm like, yo, Country Grammar was a crazy album, right? And people laugh at me, like, what? I'm like, yo, listen, yo, he had like seven to eight singles on the album. Join with Diamond. Diamond. Yeah. Join with Diamond. Uh, 10, 000, 10 million people liked that album for a reason. <laughs> I, remember, yeah. I went on. A, I remember I, I was I was hanging out with this, with this with this female, and she put the album in. This is back when I was like, probably like 18, 19. I'm like, don't play this album. And she played, and I heard every song. I'm like, that's a hit. This is before they were hits, though. This was yeah. like me just hearing the album. I'm like, yo, that's a hit. So yeah. people might not like that, but it's a lane for it. So, so I think you're a true artist. So by you putting that stuff out there, you're always going to be a little like, you know, a little tentative a little bit. Like, I don't know, yeah. man. I put this, this is my art. If you don't like yeah. it. But how how'd you get over that, 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 that feeling or that thought process to put music out though. Cause a lot of people record, but never put nothing out. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I never, never make, never send it to anybody. How do you yeah. get over that? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's still like, you know, I just kind of put the blinders on when I do it at this point. Um, you can't help but have an emotional connection to, you know, these are thoughts I had in my head and what if everybody thinks they're whack? What if nobody likes it? What if nobody relates to it? They don't like, and then, you, you start seeing people, you know, and it, there's a trolling culture that we have now right. where people feel like they have to criticize something, like to the point where like the criticism don't make sense. Like, you know, I'm open to criticism. I think it's a great tool for improvement. You know what I'm saying? Like you really want to hear people's, cause they might point out something you didn't realize, right? So I'm always trying to get better. So if somebody can point out a flaw in my game, like, yo, you really need to work on your, you know, your, your step back on the left side when you're pulling up, you know, you, that shot doesn't <laughs> go in that much for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm all open for that. But sometimes it's just, it feels like they're trying to find something to say. Like they, they didn't do their job if they didn't criticize you. Right. Um, and then, I listen to some of my friends argue with me that Jay Z's not good. Right? So I'm like, yo, <laughs> this dude's a new friend. Y'all He's a new friend. Come up 95. Come up 95 with us, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be like, yo, so if, if Jay can get criticized with all the work he's done, if Eminem can get criticized, if Biggie and Tupac can get criticized, like who am I not to get criticized? You know what I'm saying? But you know so, it is, it's different though because I think what people do now, like you stated, the trolling culture, yeah, it's constructive criticism, right? If you're gonna criticize somebody with something, but you know, it's this thing called carry the debt. I'm not sure if you guys heard mm -hmm. that, but carry the day is when, say, you managing somebody, and before you tell them something bad that they did, you tell them six things that they did well. So yeah. you say, you know what, you you did this, this was good, this was good, this was good, but that, you know, fix that. A lot of right. people forget that compliment part go right yeah. to the to the issue and everything else yeah. gets lost in translation so that's yeah. the that's culture we live in man which is sad yeah, man. but it is or, what it is or if, you, if you're gonna call something whack like say why you thought it was whack you could re True. you could respect that yeah it gotta be constructive yeah. yeah um so how's life in the, in the dmv in general like what's the temperature like with everything going on um it's it's weird man like so like the part of, you know, Virginia is a really like long state, right? So like, you could drive like here. That. Yeah, yeah, I-95, I'm sure, right? Yeah, so like you, you gotta come down that corridor. So you could drive five hours and still be in Virginia, right? Um, so like up here, it's very similar to the culture that you guys have up there, right? So yeah. it's, it's a lot of progressive. I mean, Virginia is a blue state now, politically speaking, right? So the demographics have definitely shifted and the large like the big seismic shift has been in this area like all the way down to like Woodbridge which is considered northern Virginia so up here it's um very progressive very receptive to Black Lives Matter and kind of a lot of woke people right so of all you know cultures and ethnicities but I mean you could drive a little bit further south or a little bit west and then you're seeing you know a lot of you know Trump 2020 every lawn, like every single lawn got that on there. You know what I'm saying? So, um, like, I feel like we, we can't really gauge what the politics is right now because the people that you only seeing the people that are like, like vocal about how they feel that, that right, they feel yeah. strong enough about it to let you know. 
So I don't know. Like, there might be a guy that's getting Starbucks in front of me, and he might be a Trump supporter, but he's just scared to say it, right? So yeah. it's hard to say that this race is over, you know what I'm saying? And it's hard to gauge kind of how people are until they get in that voting booth and they actually pull the trigger. Yeah, because, like, you, can, you, you got some jokers that will just be like, yo, Trump's my guy. And I actually, I actually respect that if you out there with it. But there's a bunch yeah. of dudes like, yo, we rapping by and go in that booth and do something totally sneaky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nah, it's sneak nah, see, Yeah, exactly. Nah, 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 see, see, my thing is, I just want people to vote, right? Whoever you're gonna vote for. But then I want people to say, all right, if you are gonna vote for Trump, you have to agree that you're picking whatever your agenda is over certain things. So yeah. that means you don't care about the divisiveness or you don't care about racism. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. you as much. You just yeah. have to admit that because yeah. when you're not admitting that, to me, that's where I have a problem with it. When you're saying like everything is good, like, no, no, no. Yeah. Everyone makes mistakes with certain things, right? We all get that. But when you're on purpose being divisive and doing things and you telling me that, no, that's all good, you're for it. That's a problem yeah. I have with just our people in general or just people that are on, say, the left, the left, where we fight with each other. We had on our previous show, we talked about that, well, two shows ago, right? Right there. Yeah. But it seems like people like we pull on each other, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll go, I don't like this about so and so or that and take it to the grave, right? And then we'll be fighting. And then on the, on the right side, they'll go, Now nah, I'm still backing them. I don't care. Yeah. I don't understand why we can't do the same thing. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, so double standard for sure, with. man. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, you know, I, I, I heard a, a church sermon today from uh, Pastor Wesley. He's like this big time. Uh, like one of the oldest black churches is right in Alexandria, Virginia. Obama used to come here for service and he does a Tuesday night service. And he was talking about, he's actually a very politically woke guy that will, you know, step out on his like principles, even though, you know, it's going to offend a lot of people. Like he'll stand yeah. on something, which I totally respect. And he was saying like, yo, he's just dumbing things down. Right. And people mm -hmm. like simplified messages. They like three word chants, lock her up, you know, black guy, bad. Right. These are easy <laughs> things to understand. You know what I'm saying? They can get behind it and they could put it on a bumper sticker. So he's actually I don't know if like the world is kind of going towards him or whether he's going to the world, but he's mastered the simplification down. And people just don't want to think they don't want to understand nuance. And you see that in music, too. Right. Like the stuff yep. that is at the forefront is the repetitive nursery rhyme kind of rhyme. Right. Or That's the easiest thing to sell. You're selling downhill everybody gets it you don't have to be smart you don't have to like research anything it's so like he's actually replicating what society is and what we've become you know what i'm saying Definitely. it's just scary like if this it's is what scary. we come to you know what i'm saying like yeah, he's the hero and john mccain's the villain like yeah <laughs> we which devolved to that <laughs> which is crazy to me but it's, it's nuts yeah. but but that's why we like you like your music so much because like you said you're not dumbing down anything so i so i always think that you know you put your your art out there and you don't dumb it down for nobody. I mean, any artist. I don't care who it is. Just do you. And and a true artist, you're gonna follow that. Like I'm a Nas fan. But I don't like every Nas album. Me too. Yeah. 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 And like, I'm Thanks. a Jay fan. I don't like every Jay album. But Me they're too. artists, and I can go. You know what? I don't like that, but I respect it. I like this better. But as far as being an artist, you know what I'm saying? That's the nuance that we're missing, right? Like it's 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 binary. It's love or hate, true or false. Like you can't be like, yo, I love Jay Z, but I didn't like. Um, you know, uh, the, the joint you did with Kanye or I didn't like the, you know, Blueprint 2 was not my thing. Like, yeah. you can do both things. You, you you can be a Jay fan. You can be a Jay stan and be like, yo, that's, that's I don't like that. That one wasn't for me. That's well, being objective. Well, yeah. Derek can tell you, he, he already know how I feel about certain Jay stuff. I'm like, yo, I don't got to hear it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And he's like, real. I'm like, nah, I haven't heard. I don't need to hear it. Like, I'm good. But I don't dislike Jay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Jay's, Jay's still my like top three, and we always be regardless. I just don't yeah. need to hear certain things. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That's, that's just that's just me. You know right. what I'm saying? That's, that's for another show. <laughs> 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 All right, Abel. What do you um, musically? What do you want to follow this up with? Man, I got a bunch of joints I didn't release. Like when I record, I do it in flurries, so I'll do like maybe like maybe ten songs in a week. Um, and I might have two weeks or three weeks where I go straight. So I'll, I'll be sitting on 30 joints. Um, but then at the same time, you don't want to like oversaturate, you know, because you, you're putting too much stuff out, then you're not able to let the people sit on the content and let it right. actually do its thing. So um, I am I have like this album that is already ready to go. It's called Vanguard. And it's, it's not as political, but there's like a lot of like soul and boom bap. And I think that 
um, I'm probably gonna release that like around Thanksgiving time. Just okay. let uh, Truth to Power do his thing a little bit. You know, the other thing I was thinking was, yo, Stu might win the election. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> yeah. All the stuff I said, might, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, you know what it is? It, it, it's, it's, it's definitely timely because if he wins it, he wins it, right? We know what it is. If he don't, which he shouldn't win, but you, like you got, it's, it's those secret voters. We don't know yeah, who's behind that wolf when you're in there. And I, all, all, all respect to you, but I mean, I think it's still need to come out. Whatever you're gonna say, say it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it is what it is. I might right. get a knock on my door though. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you are pretty close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't you know, do this, <laughs> well, yeah, I wanted to ask you too, uh, Abel, about your uh, recording process. I know you don't write anything down, but I know you also have a mobile studio yeah, that, yeah. That, that you talked about in, in one of your interviews. So can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, man. So like it actually came from, um, like I, I just was experimenting one time. And um, like I had gotten a new mic and I wanted to test how it sounded and I didn't want to wait to get to the house. So I was in the parking lot and I plugged it in and I just recorded like, you know, just kind of just some some raw audio. I didn't think too much of it. I went back and listened to it and I was like, yo, this actually sounds really good. Like there was no feedback, there was no echoing, it was clean. Um, it felt like it was a studio quality sound. So um, I was like, yo, I'm driving to the studio. I'm paying for studio time. I got to wait till the studio's available to record, right? I need an engineer in there because I can't do everything myself. So, like, it's creating this this uh, workflow that that staggers my efficiency as, a, as an artist, right? And, you know, my inspiration comes in moments. So, by the time I figure all that out, I might not feel the same way. Right. So I just started doing it in the car. And, like, I was sending it to, like, people to master and mix. And I didn't tell them anything. And they, they thought I recorded it in the studio. So, I was like, yo, this is the way to go because... I can just pull over, like literally that whole Truth to Power, like four songs were recorded. Like I pulled over on the highway because I, I heard something that inspired me and I literally just laid the vocals down like on the side of the road. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So it gives you that freedom to be, as soon as that creativity hits you, um, like as an artist, there's energy that comes in every song. Like if I tried to re-record a song I already did, I would it wouldn't sound the same. Like sure. I, I, whatever that inspiration is in the moment is gonna change it. So just being able to do it right away and then just being able to cut the, the time. Like I can literally do a record, mix and master it within like four hours. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's dope. That's dope. Which a lot of artists, should, I mean, they should, technology is so cheap now. You can get like a $400 laptop and download like software to be able to record like literally in your room. You know what I'm yeah, saying? So there's no now. excuse for an artist to be like, nah, you know, I, I can't put my music out because it's at your fingertips. Uh, I was going to ask you about putting music out in general. So how do you feel about, well, we all know how streaming is. Streaming is big. Streaming is good. I mean, for the consumer. It's yeah. good for the consumer, but not always yeah, for the yeah. artist. How do you feel about that accessibility to your fans and being able to put music out when you want to, you know, yeah. and plus your independence? So how do you like that process? How is it different? How has it developed throughout the years? Because when was your first um, project that you put out? What year was it? Yeah, you? commercially, I started releasing everything that's on my, um, like on my Spotify, iTunes, everything is 2020 and on. So I started I releasing I stuff. Yeah, it was yeah. like March. It was right, right, right when COVID, like when they started doing the lockdowns, that's when I started putting yeah. it out. Okay. Yes. You got yeah. some SoundCloud stuff though too, right? Yeah, the SoundCloud stuff was like probably 2016. I started messing around a little bit. Yeah. And you could like if you if you go down my timeline, you can see the sound quality getting better and better. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know. I doubt. figured some things out. Yeah. It's the same with our podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, well, same the podcast. You gotta start from somewhere and you start yeah. seeing the improvement, man. That's dope though. But um, but as far as with the streaming in general, how do you feel about it being able to get it out there as fast? You know, do you like that or Good and bad, you know what I'm saying? It's like with everything, like there's, there's, a, there's a, a pro and a con. Um, like the money is definitely the con, you know what I'm saying? Because think about yeah. albums used to be $15.99 on average, right? So if you sell 100,000, you know what I'm saying? 1.5, like right there. Yeah. Um, streaming the math is like ridiculous. Like you just getting pennies on, a, like fraction of a penny on the streams, but um, you can reach so many more people. Right, like, and this, mm -hmm. I remember like the process, like the pain I had to go through to make one record on, on a karaoke machine when we first started out. <laughs> you know, you had to get your whole song in one take. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you sneeze yeah, no at the end of the verse. Yeah. No punch-ins. You can't even ruffle the page. Like when I was turning <laughs> the page, I was like turning it like that so the mic didn't catch it. 
So, um, like, so it, it actually, that, that filtered out a lot of artists, you know what I'm saying? Cause you had to love it to go through that process. You just didn't have like people waking up one day saying, I'm going to be a rapper. You know what I'm saying? Like to, yeah. to put yourself through that process. And then even after you do that, you have one cassette in your hand That's all <laughs> that you, you can give to one person. You know what I'm saying? That's it. So That's it. it's crazy. You just go around the, you know, the globe in like 24 hours now, but that also hurts the artists because everybody's a rapper now, right? So yeah. they're not they're not committing themselves to like their craft and they're not, you know, necessarily focusing on the art. Like the hashtag is more important than the 16. Right. Because the hashtag's what's gonna sell the music, right? So that's what you end up seeing like a low level of quality. And, and um shout out to uh Brick City, um Brick City Buddha. Buddha. Yeah, live. Y'all had him as a guest. Um, yeah, I've been following him. He he had a dope live where he was talking about how like people now the artists the artistry's gone because like the consumers' expectation and their standards have been watered down. And it all started kind of like when you know rap kind of right around the crunk era we started just kind of wanting to have vibes more than actual lyrics. But yeah. you know, when you add the technology to it, then it, it really diminishes like any kind of curation or quality control. Radio is really not as big as a factor as they used to be. So yeah. the program managers can't really influence as much. So if you got a good hashtag and you got something that people are vibing to, you could get popping like overnight, you know? Right. So yeah. that's kind of a bad side for the artists, but I guess for consumers it's good because they can get music um, at their fingertips. At their fingertips. Right. Yeah, so definitely. So who else are you listening to now? Yo, Sky Zoo's always on my my, my playlist, that's, man. That's my guy, that, man. That, that boy is busy, man. Every time I've never heard a bad verse from him. Um, I really, I like Graf. Um, Graf, yeah. Graf is like yeah, Graf is tough, dope. man. Man, he is, he's, he's very versatile as an artist. Like, his range is, like, ridiculous. He can go Eminem. He can go um, Public Enemy on you. He can get you, like, Coogee Rap. I mean, he's just Whatever super you want, dope. he got it. Yeah, yeah he got it. His bag is ridiculous. Um, and then, like, I, I listen to, like, a lot of old stuff. Like, I, 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 it was written as, like, one of my favorite all-time albums. I know, like, Illmatic is kind of everybody's go-to. Nah, but it was written between us. It was like, to me, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, had, they had the lyrics in the, in the, in the, in the pamphlet, you know what I'm yep. saying? It right. came with it, right? So you could read every single word. There was no confusion. Um, so like, I miss those I, days. <laughs> yeah, right? That's yeah. another bad side of streaming, right? It's like you're just getting kind of the audio, but you're not getting like the whole CD with the leaflets and the inserts and all that. It was um, a process, like opening it, getting the plastic off of it. Waiting till Tuesday, right? Everybody had to wait till Tuesday to get out records and buy the, you know, whatever was dope. Um, but then now you can buy like, you know, you don't have to buy the whole album. Like I like that whole fact that you can just purchase songs. songs you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause sometimes there were artists where I only wanted three songs for real, but I had to you know, <laughs> pay 15 bucks to get three songs, you know what I'm saying? Right. $5 a song. But now you can just pick the songs that you like. So, I mean, for I think for consumers, it's amazing. Like, to be able oh, to pay absolutely. $10 a month and access everything. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I feel like a sucker for giving Tower Records all that money, man. Word. <laughs> I waited until 2020. I got it for 10 bucks a month. But like you said, it's the experience in certain, certain things. Like, you can't get, like, De La Soul on stream yeah, because of that man. whole Tommy Boy Tommy thing Boy. that they had. Yeah. So it's like, I see the gift and the curse of it. I miss back in the days of going to Tower Records or going to virgin or whatever and buying it you know right he's, he's going to 42nd um street and go to the virgin mega store to, to get the records yeah so Times square to, right yeah, yeah Times square had to had the yeah. in store there sometime but like it's a different vibe now to where i'm getting so much music that i'm kind of like i'm kind of jaded it's you know what I'm saying? bro yeah, yeah it's kind of yeah, like, like what came out already that came yeah. out all right I, I hear it i hear it in three weeks you yeah. know so back, back in the day it's like i'm hearing it that day that night i'm yeah. hearing it's dark and hell is hot. I'm hearing it right there. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you know what I mean? Yo, but, you know what's crazy, man? I was watching the, the uh, Rough Riders documentary, like the Chronicles. Dope. Yeah. Right? So um, it was a part on DMX, right? So that year when he dropped It's Dark as Hell is Hot and then Flesh of My Flesh in like a yeah, calendar so year, he got six months. two number ones, right? So two number one, not rap and R&B. He got two number one top 100s, right? Yeah. Back to back. Like this is video game level like numbers. <laughs> and when he went to he went to Billboard to get his award, the award was for R and B. Yeah, because they hadn't even recognized hip hop as a form of art Word. at that point. This is 1999. 
which is crazy. Which, 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 so that yeah. means the, the R&B dude got jerked. <laughs> X came yeah, in like, and took it, right? It, it's probably like Cisco's crazy. song. Probably Drew like, yeah, Hill. Right, song. Yeah. It probably Drew Hill. Yeah, probably Cisco. Yeah, Drew <laughs> now, yeah. it's funny you said A Flesh in My Flesh. Like, I didn't like that album, yo. Yeah, we got the one. He's bugging. The second one. No, oh, I, man. That's, listen, that, that, that's up there listen, with the first one. Now, yeah, so you man. know why I didn't like it? I didn't like the Damien joint, the remake of the Damien with, with Marilyn Manson. Bar, man. Yeah. I didn't like it, bro. I, didn't like, I just didn't like I just didn't. I think that it was something. But even they said it. Didn't they say it on the Chronicles? They were like, yo, they rushed that album out. Because they didn't yeah. even have the same producers. Like, uh, the producers that... Um, Dane, Dane Reese and all Dane that. Dane Reese and my other, yeah. the other dude wasn't really Swiss. there. And Swiss yeah. was taking over that. He was working on his sound. Yeah. So Swiss, they kind of rushed that album out. I didn't, I felt it. I thought it was rushed. I bought yeah. it. I like Blackout, a few other tracks. Blackout, yeah, like, that was crazy. Yeah, I was like, yo, I'm really not feeling this album. I ain't li- yo, I heard it one time, and, no, twice, and never heard the whole album all the way through again. You better hop on title, brother. Nah, I'm good. That vibe passed me, man. I can't I get that back. So, so besides music, what, what you watching anything on TV? Oh um, man, I've, I've been. Y- y'all watch Dave? Nah, I heard. Nah, it's good. I heard it's good. Yo, though. it's on Hulu, right? Yeah, yeah. it's on. It's, yeah, on actually, right? it's on FX. Like uh-huh, it okay. airs on FX, and then um, it yo. So you you know the storyline, kind of like what it is. Nah, nah. I heard it's mad so, funny though. Yeah, it's like this. F- uh, he's, yeah. he's all right. So he's a Jewish rapper, right? So he's like super like. You would not like. He looks like he works at the Gap or at Banana Republic, right? And he wants to be a rapper, and he's dead nice on the mic, but he's trying to figure out a way to get attention. So, like in the first episode, he tries to get a feature from YG, um, and then YG ends up kind of jerk stiffing him, but he puts him on his live, so he goes viral. And um, like it's just like the journey of this white kid trying to make it. In, it's like almost eight mile like, but. Mm-hmm. At least Eminem was from Eight Mile. This is right. like a dude that's like completely not from the culture, but okay. it's in him. You know what I'm saying? Like the culture is in him, and it's oh, yeah. just like the journey and the struggle of him trying to kind of make it into this where he's outside. It's like reverse racism. It's like Jeremy Lin. You know what I'm saying? Like Jeremy <laughs> Lin is like if you if you if you're trying to go into like technology, he's the perfect prototype, right? Asian white man, Asian male from. Harvard, like he's the guy that's gonna make the next Snapchat or whatever. Yep. He comes on the block to play ball. He's the last dude getting picked. They're like, man, you just do it out of here. But yeah. then when he connects, then he gets the reverse. You know, he gets the the momentum of that because he's the first dude that made it. And they're like, oh, he can really do it. Right. So then he gets the Eminem effect where you're selling twenty million because they're like, oh man, he really has the skills to make it. And then now he's an outlier. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So how, how about sports? Who, are you um, like- NBA. I think NBA is doing a masterful job, man. Like the way Adam Silver set this up, like he, it's like I almost feel like I'm watching like regular NBA. Like the way that they were able to not right. have any cases of testing positive, and um, also the fact that they put Black Lives Matter on the court. Like to me, that tells me that number one, LeBron's influence is getting to where the owners are. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody in the NFL has that much power to 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 make the league come to them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, to me, it's a recognition of black athletes. And, you know, we see it with like the, the ownerships and, you know, when Danny Ainge creates a super team, he's a genius. GM mm-hmm. of the year. LeBron creates a super team. He's weak. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, where, why is that the double standard? Why all them teams that won them championships, the, the Lakers weren't stacked. Showtime Lakers weren't stacked. The, the Boston Celtics weren't stacked. You know, Detroit Pistons weren't stacked. Everybody's a super team. But when the GMs do it, and the owners do it, they get awards. And then when the players try to do it, you know, they get like ridiculed, like, oh, they don't have competition in them. So <laughs> to me, like having that Black Lives Matter on there, it's like the players are taking like ownership and they know their value. And I'm just looking for the same kind of thing in like music and other forms of entertainment where like the people that are stars and that they're kind of like the vanguards of, of um, the culture are able to have equity in it. Um, and, and sway, you know, in the corporate, in the boardrooms and stuff, you know? Word. Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting your take on Brian, because I, I look at, we said, I said Brian has King disease. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't feel like Nas at the same time? <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't say it's, uh, <laughs> yo, you might be a rapper. You, you diss Nas and big up LeBron in a single bar. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's no, nice. but 
<laughs> no, nah, but I think I think he, I think Bron's thing is like it's not his fault. Like this is like I think because of the way and I blame it on AAU basketball. I, we have me and me and Derek have you talked all, offline about this, but I blame everything on the way the culture is with the kids, right? So if you got the kid and the kid has been tabbed the next great thing at like 13 years old, yeah, he he's treated that way. When he gets mm-hmm. to a certain level, he's used to that. It ain't his fault. Like he's not. You can't tell him no. You know what I'm saying? When, yeah. you, when you tell him no, he's he's gonna start pouting or getting mad. And I think LeBron yeah. went through that stage. So he does things now that you're like, well, why is LeBron doing that? It's not his fault. He he doesn't know. Like he doesn't True. know since he was 14 years old. You call him the, the, the chosen one. Like, yeah. like what you, what you want? But to do? you know what? The the flip side of that is he had to live up to that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Oh, yes. So yeah, there's a lot of dudes that, that that had the crown and never lived up to it. You know what I'm saying? This dude yeah. never had a parking ticket that we know about. You know what I'm saying? No baby mama drama. Nobody coming out doing paternity tests on this dude. No DUIs. And he had all that pressure since he was 17. And he came from a single home. His mom is wilding out. All the things that were stacked against him. And this dude is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is the dude that's got the trouble. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) The parents, he went to Stanford. He's the dude that got kicked out of golf for like five years. LeBron came from the hood. You know what I'm saying? You can't find a thing. He's building schools. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, that's the thing that I think nobody can can take from LeBron. Like you can say whatever you want to say about him on the court, and we all have our own views of what we want. But when it comes to off that court, yeah, what he does and what he's doing, he's like untouched. He he he's a goal of that to me. Yeah, you know what I mean by far. Yeah. All right. Oh, I have one more thing right. before before yeah. we even go to our rapid fire session. I saw some you did something drastic that I want to talk about real quick briefly. Okay. I looked at your Instagram and yeah. I looked at you. You had a physical transformation. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, and I think that I want you to touch on that because I think that's very important because, you know, just to see what, what made you do that. Um, and also, you know, how, did, how has it helped you, you know, throughout your life? You know what I'm saying? With, you know, before and after. So what I'm talking about, Abel had a, I, you, you say it, man, because <laughs> you, you basically said you lost a lot of, yeah, a lot yeah, of weight, yeah. man. I, I went from uh, the nutty professor to buddy love. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what happened. Like, if you look at those photos, the before and after, um, it was like uh, from my all-time high, like the, it was 111 pounds, like total loss, right? Okay. Um, it was over a course of like probably like, a, I'd say like nine months. You know what I'm saying? Like nine months, wow. almost a year, like the better part of a year. Um, and like the motivation – for it was just being tired of kind of just not being in shape. So when I was younger, I was athletic, I played ball. And then, you know, you, you have this span of time where, you know, you're eating bad and you're sitting down all day and your metabolism slows down all at the same. And I went ball too. Like, so I, like, (laughs) it was was just like a bad chain of events. And I was just like, yo, I can't do nothing about the hair yet. I'm gonna wait till LeBron gets that like squared out, like all the kinks out of the way and I go get the clubs. (laughs) <laughs> but as far as the weight, I can do something about that. Right. Um, so I just started going to the gym, to be honest with you, and I started dieting. It wasn't like some sort of like, you know, uh, you know, scientific thing. It was just eat less, exercise more. And um, it's, it's, it's like I, I give people like the bank analogy. Like in, in banking, you don't want overdrafts, right? So you keep depositing, and depositing, and depositing. Food would be the deposit in this example, right? So, but you're not writing any checks out. So what ends up happening is you got a big bank account, which is you got, you know, all this weight on you. Mm-hmm. So if uh-huh. you want to reverse it, all you got to do is spend more than you're putting in. You know what I'm saying? So just keep getting those overdrafts. So if yeah. I was putting in 3,000 calories a day, right, and I wasn't exercising, if I put in, you know, 2,000 calories and I go burn 1,000 calories, now I'm in the red. Right. right. So it's just keep doing that formula over a span of, you know, a week, turn it to a month, turn it to three months, six months, and then it just disappears. Like the weight just goes away. Right. No doubt. Congratulations oh, man. on that. And plus that, man. Word, that shows yeah. drive too. And I thought it would be good for people to hear that because I didn't know that it was only nine months. You yeah. know what I'm saying, bro? So that means that you were getting in and you were grinding. So I think it's yeah. good for people to see that, that you can do stuff like that. A lot of people get, get caught up with with that at a certain level, like I can't do this or I don't have the motivation. So I thought yeah. if we brought it up on the show, whoever's watching this can see that and they can help push them to do, you know, to do what, you know, great things. And get, yeah, and get it's, it's like, like in everything, you're going to hit walls, you know what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. the first 20 pounds is going to be, you know, easy because it's water weight and 
you know what I'm saying? Your body's just getting used to it. But then all of a sudden your butt, you know, your, your heart rate doesn't go up as much anymore. So you got to keep switching up the exercises because your body's not right. going to respond. It's, it's like a wall. metaphor for life. Yeah. You're going to hit walls. Right. And then you uh -huh. just got to kind of think your way around it. Right. So no like, it's never going to be like straight up. It's never going to be straight down, but it's going to be kind of like up and down, up and down. And it's just kind of putting the blinders on and then just, you know, every day just go and do the same thing. And then eventually you're going to see long-term progress. Right. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah. All right, Abel, we're going to wrap up um, with our rapid fire. You um, listen and watch some of the shows, so you may be familiar yeah, yeah. With, <laughs> with that. So, you know, it's a good time. Um, all right, so I'll get it started. I actually got four today, man. We're using right. three. Um, let's get right to it. Nas a hoe. Oh, In a vacuum. Jay. 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 It's, right. a, it's a coin toss, 51-49. All right. <laughs> all right, no doubt. Fair enough. All right, S Steph Curry, Dwayne Wade. Steph Curry. <laughs> no Steph, question? No question, man. Ooh. I've never seen anything like him, man. All right. It's a video game. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's – so you watch Snowfall, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, what's the best scene with Franklin in it? The scene where he shot his friend when he was – it was season one. Yeah. And his mm -hmm. friend – uh, the dude that killed, he, and he was trying to get retribution. Right. Yeah. Like, he had to actually pull. Like that's when he changed. Like he went from like this dude that could be saved to like I felt like he went He's super done. after that. Yeah, yeah. He crossed the line after, after that. Uh, my favorite <laughs> scene was when uh, with him and Leon. Uh, Leon wilded out on. Um, damn, what's my name? What's my What's my man name? Um, light skin dude. Um, oh. Um, he's from the other hood. I can't, his, his name is, well, anyway, the dude Leon used to go back, back and forth for him. And Franklin had his back in the moment. And then when they oh, got. Oh, the oh, oh, man, 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 boy. Man, boy. Man, boy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then. Got him in the car, got him in the car. <laughs> I thought it was dope because that's how you, that's how you need to rock with your people. Like, like in person, you rock with them. And then you, then you get with them in a whip. Like, yo, you wilding, you messing up my business. And yeah. that's dope because Franklin's usually like reserved. Mm -hmm. Um, so when he chewed Leon out in the car, I was like, all right, that was dope. So <laughs> yeah, that was mine though. <laughs> all right. Okay. Boys in the hood or juice? Boys in the hood. Right. You know what? I know why y'all gonna say juice, because juice was in New York, right? So like yeah, yeah. I think that just I've related because this this scenes in Boys in the Hood where they talking about places I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Chief Lou Jr. Yeah, he was like, "Yo, you know, I work at the Fox Hills Mall." When he came to the barbecue, like that's the, I, I used to go to that mall all the time, so <laughs> I felt like I was I was part of that, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah I, I see different. that. I see it hit that. different then. Um, what's your favorite character on the Wire? Um, I like Marlo. Marlo. Yeah, he's got uh, so many layers to him too. Man. Yeah, he because and then they were able to build his character, like because you know, like on network TV, they got to show you the dude's gangster immediately because they they don't have time. Like with Marlo, <laughs> you didn't know who he was gonna be. He started out as just quiet dude that didn't say nothing, and he turned into like the biggest gangster in the world. Right. Yeah. All right. I I got a sneaky question for you. Yeah. All right. Retro ones, or the Elevens. Elevens, man. Right. Restaurant ones, like they're not comfortable, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as good as they look, man, they, they, they hurt. Oh, like when oh, you used to wear like foams, and you used to wear like the the newer Jays, like anything yeah. after like the fours, like them things are like Chuck Taylors when you put them on, man. Yeah, word, word. I don't know how they play ball in the things. <laughs> Yo, remember Jordan tried to play? He played them. He dropped that fifty-five or something like that. Oh no, his last game at the Garden for the Bulls, and his feet was bleeding. Yeah, his feet <laughs> was yeah. Up, man. exactly. <laughs> Yeah. All right, this is my last one. What's the best disc record of all time? Mm. Oh, man. I think that cannabis joint was hard, man. I, I thought like, he went out. Out. I, mean, yeah. I think he bodied him, man. Yeah, like, I, I don't really understand. Like, people think LL1, it doesn't make sense to me. The Def Jam put the money behind him because they couldn't afford to have him lose. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he was, the, he was the franchise. Between the lyrics and Mike Tyson being on there and everything, like just the no. bars, man. It was yeah. just about like, what he was saying. Yeah, yeah, what he was yeah. saying, it was all factual. That's the yeah. thing. See, see, I think a good diss song, you can you can make up some stuff and it's, it's, it's like whatever. 
But when you spitting facts about something, it hits yeah. totally different. He's saying 99% of your, your fans were high hills. hills. He's not lying. Yeah. Yeah, like he's yeah. saying everything. But again, the money's behind the cash cow. You can't have yeah. no little rules yeah. to the yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? He even value on 4 3 2 one. <laughs> That's yeah. it to me. True, man. Yeah. But, uh, all right, Abel, man. Appreciate appreciate having you on, man. This was dope. Yeah, this was um, dope it's been man. real, man. Keep doing what y'all doing, man. The culture needs it. More content like this, man. Appreciate it, man. You do the same and come back, man. We definitely going to have you back on, man. Appreciate it, man. I had a great time, bro. What's up? You want to shout out social yeah. media, website, album, and yeah. everything? Yeah, That's everything is a Bell Mary. So A-B-E-L-M-E-R-I. It's the same. Uh, the dot com, and it's at a Bell Mary everywhere, so. Yeah, you can Google it. My Google's starting to pop now. I just checked it the other day. I was like, uh-huh. yo, my, I'm looking like Jay out here. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. All right, well, salute to Abel Mary, man. I appreciate having you on. No um, yeah. And you can check us out anywhere our podcasts are found, YouTube, um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud. And um, yeah. salute. Appreciate y'all listening and watching. Peace. Peace.